Uh, the final speaker will be uh, Mark Andreevic talking about a strange free labor. Thanks for um, holding out and remaining. If, uh, if indeed attention is something that can be cashed in for anything we want, by now I, I'm looking in the catalog and thinking what, what we could exchange it for. Um, although I'm holding on to the cash up here just in case. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to bet on that. Um, <coughs> Thank you to Julian for, in a way, setting me up for this, uh, this presentation, which is going to be devoted to uh, raising a few questions about the notion of exploitation and suggesting uh, some possibilities in which we might think uh, uh, to explain how we are using this concept in the current conjuncture. Um, I'm going to start with a with a pretty crude pseudo-parable um, that I, I guess might reflect the crudity of the presentation also. I surprised myself with the crudeness of it, uh, although those who may have encountered my work probably won't be surprised. Um, uh, if, if we were to imagine uh, a scenario in which uh, the public street that we used to, for purposes of commerce, self-expression, communication, transport. If we were decide, to decide that uh, probably the freest and most productive way to manage that would be to turn it over to the private sector and, uh, and allow them to set the conditions of terms of entry for use of those streets. Um, and one of the conditions were, well, you, know, you don't have to pay to use the street, but what we're going to do is we will tag you and we're going to follow you around with cameras and mics and record everything that you do and, uh, and you will not have any control over uh, what information is collected or how it's used. I, I suspect that we would probably not be talking about issues of privacy, although we might be, uh, but we would be talking about uh, the social relations that made possible that arrangement, uh, and we would be calling them into question. Even, of course, if there were other dirt roads that were still available and we had the choice of, of using those, I think we might still call that into question. Uh, I also think that, or I'll, I'll suggest, uh, you may disagree, that if we said yes, but uh, uh, all of this information that's collected about us um, will not in any way, uh, it, it can be used in ways that we are not aware of, but that doesn't constitute coercion. Uh, we may not locate coercion at the site of the use of that information, but we may locate coercion at the site of those um, regimes that uh, enforced the uh, social relations that dictated who gets to set the terms of access to the road. I think there's, there's a particular place we could find coercion. Um, if uh, we were similarly told that this was the freest way and the best way to arrange uh, for the funding in support of this road, we would, uh, we would ask, I, I, I hope, why? What's the presupposition behind there? And I think we'd find an interesting performative contradiction. Again, I might be wrong about this. Uh, and that contradiction would be that um, assuming <laughs> that the use of this information uh, that was collected about us um, could be understood as a form of power and control, uh, otherwise the economic model wouldn't work, I think we would start to question what it was we meant by the freest form of development of that road. So that's a, that's a kind of crude, uh, crude parable. But it's meant, to, uh, it's meant to point out the importance of, of the notion of exploitation, I think, as a means of interrogating um, the broader context of social relations that set the terms of access to uh, uh, various components of the digital uh, economy and the infrastructure that supports it. Exploitation, I think, allows us to ask about the power relations that, uh, and, and also 
uh, thanks to John for pointing this out, the material relations uh, that undergird the forms of exchanges that take place in the context of the digital economy. That's one reason I think that exploitation is an interesting place to look. The other, place, the other reason, another couple of reasons, uh, I think it's one of the terms that, allow, that, that operates perhaps as the hinge between concepts of play and labor, uh, although I'm open to discussion on that topic as well. Um, how, what are some of the ways in which we're going to differentiate uh, between those categories? How are we going to describe uh, how are we going to participate in the various discussions that, that uh, try to frame uh, multivalenced activities that take place online as one or the other? I think exploitation is going gonna, is gonna to be one of the key terms that, uh, for entering into that discussion. And also because the notion of exploitation recurs over and over again in the current critical literature uh, on what's taking place in the digital economy. So I invoke a number of quotes from people who are participating in the conference or who have um, uh, been cited by those who are participating in the conference. Exploitation is a live term. Um, interestingly, it's, it's invoked in contexts where the claims that are being made very often, quite systematically, also describe uh, changes in the way in which the conditions of productive activity uh, are structured. Uh, changes that, in many cases, call into question what might be described as a classic account of exploitation. To me, what that means is um, we would need to update our account of exploitation to take into account those uh, changing conditions. And I'm, I, I, in, with the goal of doing that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to argue that a classic conception of exploitation in a Marxist critical sense might be a good starting place for thinking about how we would uh, want to update, qualify, uh, um, uh, and otherwise modify what we might mean by that term if we're going to continue to use it. Uh, if we're not going to continue to use it, I think the interesting question is what, if anything, would take its place in a, in a critical account? Uh, so, I, for me, these are, these are really a range of, of questions that, um, that I'm engaging with and I'm trying to parse it out in ways that I hope would be, will be helpful for discussion, assuming we've, uh, we'll have some time left for that. Uh, so I'm going to start out by making some claims that I think um, might be amenable to going back to thinking about a classic account of exploitation and then trying to run it forward. Uh, one of the claims, and I realize this is kind of, this is narrowing down uh, what we might be talking about when we talk about productive activity uh, online. And so I think one of the other questions is, um, how might we generalize, uh, so if, if it's interesting to do so, some of the claims that I'm putting forth. Um, so so to, to start off, Companies like, uh, the information that we generate about ourselves, uh, both online and off, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking of the online context now, generates commodities that are bought and sold, right? So in a, that's a very, like very simple crude, uh, or maybe not that simple, maybe, maybe still crude. Uh, the, the commodities are being generated that are bought and sold. Um, I thought I'd, I'd throw up a few examples and also some of the uh, ways in which the people who try to monetize this information market their wares. Uh, the you know, recent, uh, I don't know, media social furor over social networking sites and, and Twitter have generated a, a whole spate of startups that you may have uh, seen sprouting up. Um, all devoted to, to what they describe as sentiment analysis. Basically, uh, they claim real-time monitoring of online conversations uh, uh, I, that, that have this you know, interesting overtones of, of surveillance, listening in, wiretapping. So one of these companies, uh, one of these applications actually, listening, listening Station, promotes itself as a software solution for agencies and companies to monitor and measure online conversations. Um, this is one of their applications at work. What, you know, what are people saying about, this is a, obviously a few weeks back, um, 
the reaction to Obama's winning the Nobel Prize, or more than that. Uh, and and the, 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 you can find a lot of online demonstrations of, of what looks at, at this point to be a rather, um, uh, the, well, as far as, I, there are people here who know more about this than I do. It's, it's a rather crude technology, uh, but it, it markets itself based on, on size, sample size. You know, uh, you know, we may miss lots of nuances in these accounts, but if we can just capture a larger and larger portion of the, of the um, discussion that's going online, we can kind of correct for some of those errors. This is a company, I don't know if anybody's heard of Echometrics. It markets a, um, uh, you know, net nanny type of software that allows, that you put on your computer and, and uh, it controls where your kids can go. But it also gathers information about what your kids are doing and resells it. Uh, so Disney buys information about what kids are talking about in, in discussion groups and so on. Uh, that's in its terms of use, unless things have changed since this account came out, but it may have after the publicity. Is it, does anyone know if they've changed it? Uh, but you know, when you sign up for it, you, you kind of agree to that. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers this artwork. This is from, this was a, a book, it just, uh, I, I threw it in because Christiane Paul is here, but she's in the other session. Uh, th this was a, an artwork called um, Listening Post that, uh, what, that did the rounds, I think, in the early 2000s, and it was in the Whitney for a while. Um, and it was, it was also a kind of display of unstructured information, but not in, a, in, not, not in an attempt to structure it, but to just kind of let it flow. It was, it was monitoring conversations across the internet and actually using them to drive uh, musical composition that played alongside. Sorry, that, I just threw that in because of the uh, connection to Christiane Paul. Um, uh, I think it's worth pointing out that it's not just marketers uh, who are interested in, in this sentiment analysis. I didn't know this, actually, I should have known this. The CIA has, a, has an investment arm, of course, uh, called InQtel, uh, and in, they've recently bought a stake in one of these companies that's uh, interested in sentiment analysis. Um, and the, other, the third application, it's the fam familiar triumvirate, marketing, military, um, market, <laughs> stock market. Uh, so th the other application that these sentiment analysis machines are used for is to attempt to predict share price fluctuations based on conversations monitored in the, in the blogosphere. Uh, so all, all of these are m means of monet monetizing uh, information that's collected. And of course around, I, I was just poking around to see what was going on in this world. Um, the predictive analytics and the, sense and the um, sentiment analysis uh, world, They've both spawned, you know, conferences, a whole range of companies and businesses and consultants who are uh, coalescing around the possibility of seeing the internet not merely as a, as a um, demographic information collection site, but also as a means of kind of reading the pulse uh, of gauging uh, sentiment uh, and of uh, thereby intervening in the conversation in, in productive ways at, at strategic moments. Um, so, what to make of this? What, how, what are some of the ways in which we might bring a, a concept of exploitation to bear on the production of these um, commodities uh, or services that are based on the uh, information or data that's generated? I'd argue that there's a, there's a commodity of some type in there somewhere. Um, how might we think about this as a, as a form of exploitation? I, maybe this is an obvious question, uh, but I, I think um, I, I, uh, I'll try to parse it and see, and, and also try to imagine what some of the assumptions are uh, regarding what our conception of um, subjectivity is around which we uh, would marshal a, a critique of exploitation. I thought I'd start, but this is in part in response to some of the things that went on on the list before the conference, so I thought I'd speak to that a little bit. Um, thinking about exploitation in a, in, a, in a classic Marxist sense, I, I think it's fair to make some of the following claims. Um, it's, it's not reducible to a subjective sense of victimization. That doesn't mean to say that isn't there uh, or isn't, uh, doesn't have to uh, uh, or um, can't be there. Uh, I, I'd argue it's not the mere fact of benefit from another's productive activity, uh, and it's not, not the mere fact uh, of a lack of payment or a wage payment in any case. Um, I, I think, I, okay, I, again, I'm, I'm throwing these out for conversation down the road. I, I think some of the elements of a notion of exploitation would have to include the following. Some form of coercion. Um, 
uh, of course, the classic Marxist account is meant to describe how coercion uh, comes to colonize what seems to be a free exchange. That's, that's the account. Uh, given that that's the account, I think there's a certain salience for that observation to the observations that are made about the current digital economy, which, which basically recapitulate the argument, well, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is free, this is a, f a free agreement, this is not, doesn't take place under conditions of coercion. Um, the, I, 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 the whole purpose of marshalling an account of exploitation, I think, is to highlight where, uh, where coer coercion exists within the context of, of what appears to be freedom. Um, the capture of value, uh, surplus uh, unpaid value that results from this coercion, although uh, payment for the value is not also, uh, it does not in itself uh, mean that exploitation has been undone. Um, the, uh, what's important for my own thinking about this is the way in which processes of separation, again, which Julian referred to in, in his talk, uh, underlie um, the forms of coercion uh, uh, or, or underlie the ability to make an account of where coercion might be located. Um, so, the, and that was, I meant to, to try to highlight that in this, in this parable that I started off with. Uh, you know, what are the, where does, where does coercion lie when we think of um, a naturalized understanding of the internet as a commercially supported medium? Uh, it, it may not lie at the moment of our willing participation in, in a particular type of exchange in which we submit information about, or we submit to monitoring in exchange for services, but it may, it may lie in the background of that decision. Um, and alienation, again, which Julian brought up, thank you. Uh, I, the notion of alienation, I th to me, I think, is also one that's important in the accounts that I put up earlier. I think it's lurking in all of the moments where people invoke the notion of exploitation, even if it's not made explicit. Uh, and alienation actually posits a particular version of subjectivity, I think. So if, if we, or at least one might have to reconfigure our conception of the subject in order to, uh, if we wanted to change our notion of, of what alienation is. Um, uh, but I, I, I think the notion of, of alienation is a moment in which our own activity comes to appear as something turned back against us, as an alien power over and against oneself, is one that is, again, implicitly uh, embedded in accounts of exploitation. That somehow what's taking place um, is a way in which our own activity becomes foreign to ourselves. Uh, and, and I think this, uh, this is implicit to accounts of govern governance, power, control. Uh, all of these buzz terms. Again, I'm, I'm uh, happy to talk about this. Um, so how would we update this type of an account to think of what's taking place in, in some of the online context that we might be talking about, uh, where uh, in particular, I'm interested in the ones in which data collection takes place, uh, which is most of them. Um, uh, one of the claims that can be made is, well, there is uh, the type of exchange that takes place in the digital economy, in particular in examples where uh, we access services of one kind or another in exchange for willing or unknowing submission to detailed forms of monitoring, uh, does not take place against the background of coercion, or at least not in, a, in um, the, familiar, the more familiar sense of, of wage labor relations uh, or other uh, uh, industrial era forms of exploitation. Um, although, again, some of the other accounts so far today, I think, suggest uh, other ways we might think about how coercion takes place. Um, I wonder also if this, if the charge, uh, if the claim that's often made, well, coercion doesn't operate here, actually conserves uh, a distinction even while those who make it are ostensibly bypassing it, uh, or uh, claiming that it's surpassed, I should say, uh, that the distinction between uh, consumption and labor is no longer operative, uh, but <laughs> that was, this would be the position I'm imagining. Um, but we're going to preserve that distinction for the purposes of claiming that when we go to something like Facebook, we're not engaged in, uh, in 
uh, labor were engaged in some form of consumption or, or pleasure. Uh, and again, I know that's a, that's a kind of account here that people here wouldn't make, but I just wanted to point out what I think is a, is a kind of an internal contradiction in some of the more celebratory accounts um, that on the one hand posit an overcoming of this distinction, but on the other preserve it in order to claim that this realm itself is actually not subject to uh, the forms of power relations that structure workplace uh, activity. Um, is the surplus that takes place appropriated or free? Uh, I think this gets to the question of, of alienation as well. Uh, and, and here I think, uh, again, some of the accounts that people might want to make would argue that uh, both take place, that there is surplus uh, that's a free surplus, uh, and there's a surplus that's appropriated. Uh, how might one distinguish between those two? I think, again, I'd suggest that the, that the notion of alienation might be a place where one could distinguish between those two. The activity that becomes uh, alienated, over which one, uh, which, which becomes alien and turned back on oneself, uh, that's, that becomes a sign of uh, the expropriated uh, surplus. Um, unpaid. Uh, since this isn't a, a salary arrangement, and again, I think previous speakers spoke, spoke to this, uh, how are we to conceptualize the exchange that takes place? Do we think of the access to the service as a form of payment, as a form of compensation, a la um, um, Canadian guy, Smythe, sorry, <laughs> uh, 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 the uh, political economy of, of audiences? Um, might we also think about the exchange that takes place as already being in some ways structured by a changing workplace environment uh, and changing expectations, at least in some sectors of the economy, for uh, uh, people in the workplace? Um, uh, or might we think of uh, other uh, forms of extraction of surplus value based on coercion that aren't wage labor forms of coercion? Um, again, domestic labor in, in uh, uh, in industrial society. Uh, alienation. How might we describe uh, alienation within the context of the use of this information? And I'll try to, I'll try to provide an account of that in a second. Uh, but I thought I'd give one more example to, uh, to kind of wind up with and discuss. Uh, this is an application developed by a company called Aperio. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. Uh, that um, allows employers to piggyback on the social networks of their employees. Uh, Maybe people are already uh, ahead of me on this. So the, but the idea is uh, companies are realizing that the social networks available to their uh, employees are actually assets that can be used for uh, marketing, recruiting, uh, and um, sales purposes. Uh, so the idea here is the employee, and uh, the, it's the press release that I like the best. I'll show you an example. Um, uh, Aperio's first Facebook product, My Friends at Work, connects the sophisticated CRM capabilities of Salesforce.com. Uh, this is a, a cloudware company that uh, uh, is able to connect to other forms of uh, marketing databases. With the viral social networking capabilities of Facebook, of the Facebook platform giving users a powerful business tool to deepen customer relations and assist with sales and marketing efforts. Uh, so here's the stuff in the press release. This extension helps increase the size of a company's virtual account team by leveraging relationships that employees might already have. Uh, and and here's, here's, here's where moments of um, uh, alienation, I think, start to be, we could start to think about their salience. Uh, the employee can see if a friend has become a lead, bought a product, attended an event, et cetera. If the employee chooses, they can contract their friend through Facebook, uh, sorry, contact their friend, <laughs> contract, contact, whatever, to make a connection and ultimately help contribute to the company's bottom line. And I, I, I love the, lot, the, the rhetoric of choice here is, is interesting to me, right? If you so choose, uh, and, and also the rhetoric of payment. Isn't that interesting? Both of the logics of kind of free online labor come to colonize the workplace in this instance. Like, you're free to choose, uh, and, um, Maybe we'll pay you. <laughs> right? uh, you know, it's 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 the, it's not we're paying you to have access to this. It's a it's a different set of, of logics, uh, and maybe even their own bonus, right? Uh, maybe not. Um, but the uh, 
the, the logic at work here, of, once you start to, to uh, again, I, I'm not sure wh what direction this is going to go into, but once you start to think this way, a certain set of logics click into place. Ah, look at these. Our employees have all of these connections. Uh, these kids coming out of school now, they have 500, 600, I don't know, 2,000 friends. Uh, what are the ways in which we can leverage these networks? Uh, and then, then you can imagine already the reflexive response. Is this too, uh, maybe this is again too crude on my part, but um, gee, I'm going on the job market. Uh, you know, what are some of the assets that employers are looking for these days? Uh, you know, what constitutes a high value social network? How does one build a high value social network? How does one leverage it for oneself on the market? How does one uh, uh, put one's own uh, sociality to work uh, here. And I, I think this is a moment where we might start to describe uh, ways in which forms of alienation come to, uh, uh, come to bear uh, and <coughs> allow us to, to make accounts of exploitation. The thing about Aperio is it allows me to bring to bear workplace relations, right, to say actually what's taking place here is the, oops, okay, uh, five minutes? Okay, thanks. Uh, is, is actually to say, well, what's taking place here is, is maybe a different case from uh, other forms of social networking um, or online activity that we might talk about, because this is actually a, a question that is clearly structured by workplace relationships. Hi, my employee, I'm your boss. Um, uh, I'm asking you, would you be willing to you know, turn your uh, social network over to, to the company? Um, uh, so in that sense, the question is, is this case, case like Aperio, does it tell us anything that we can generalize uh, beyond the very specific case of, you know, uh, I don't know, startups trying to find ways to entrepreneurialize and capitalize on uh, social networks? Uh, I was looking through some of the news accounts of this stuff, and, and I came across, I, I, I think one rejoinder one might make is um, perhaps the, the the notion that social networking only comes to serve on the part of an employee as a, as a kind of productive workplace asset when something as obvious as a purio comes in and tries to exploit it. That may be a limited way of looking at what's taking place in terms of certain sectors of the economy, right? Uh, and uh, this was a comment made by an employer interviewed about social networking sites in general. Uh, may serve uh, they are a fundamental communication tool to probably more than half of our workforce. This is not because of a period. This is because of the way in which um, uh, social networks, uh, at least in some sectors of the economy, become an important uh, part of the productive capability of employees. Um, this question of surplus uh, free and, and appropriated, I guess I'll, I'll leave that for discussion because I've, I've already brought that up. Um, I, I thought I'd bring up one more example of I, I, and I don't know if this will, what type of impact this will have on you, but I, I was trying to think again of what it might mean to conceive of our own activity turned back uh, uh, on us in ways it, it, that become an alien force. Um, I don't know if anybody followed this. This was a while back, a few years, uh, what, well, I guess a year and a half ago or so. Um, the ad industry realized that it could, based on the information that it gathered from uh, a range of internet sites, but but search, search engines in particular, that it was actually quite easy to get access to information that was otherwise considered to be protected, such as medical information. People, when they go online, uh, when they uh, face a diagnosis of some kind or another, or, or even just anxious about uh, particular medical conditions, one of the first things they do, again, in particular contexts, is go and Google the hell out of that. Uh, and this allows <coughs> marketers to make some deductions about um, the types, at least, of anxieties or concerns uh, that they recognize on the part of people who are using the search engines, and then to target advertising based on those. Uh, I, I think an interesting thought, and, so, and the, so they decided, let's come up with a set of ethical guidelines for um, uh, who will market to based on their, uh, and on what topics based on their searches. Uh, and they came up with, you know, if you've got AIDS, cancer, or erectile dysfunction, a group of big ad advertising networks are going to promise not to remember that when you read sites. 
which is nice of them, I guess, in a way, or depending on how you think about it. Um, um, but if you have Parkinson's disease, congestive heart failure, or warts, uh, they've decided that's okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, this tells us something about what's considered stigmatized and how marketers think about pe how people react to uh, particular conditions. Uh, but it also, it also tells us, I think, or I, it allows us to engage in a particular thought experiment, which is to imagine um, uh, what how might information uh, that you generate about yourself come to uh, emerge as an unrecognized force over and against you? Uh, and I'll just say a, quick, a few couple of quick things in closing. Um, some contemporary forms of alienation, uh, which I might also think of as forms of, of um, asymmetrical uh, uh, data collection, uh, I think there are a few dimensions in which we can look at them. One is control over the database, right? Who is it who uh, uh, has access not just to information that's collected, but to the ability to aggregate, sort, process it, and so on. The speed of processing, I think it's fascinating to me in the, uh, in the um, uh, recent spate of social net, uh, of the um, sentiment analysis uh, startups. The goal there is real-time analysis as fast as possible. How they're marketing it is, uh, adjustments are taking place in the, uh, the affective whole that can be capitalized on uh, through, through process of arbitrage, but the faster you get it, the, uh, the, the more advantage you're gonna have in the, in the arbitrage relationship. That it's gonna be that moment of speed. Uh, and of course, access to that type of speed uh, is, is determined by the relations that structure who's got the databases, who's got, who have the applications that collect this information. Uh, finally, I think it's just worth saying, uh, making one more observation about data that's collected. It's not just that data is collected, data is generated, data is, is created. Uh, one of the um, uh, persi persistent and developing online information processing uh, strategies is not just to collect information about what people do, but to create uh, controlled, randomized controlled experiments constantly on an ongoing basis to look for any deviation in groups in terms of response rates, in terms of effectiveness of particular strategies, manipulation, use of information. So, so we think not just of a, of a space in which information is collected, but a space in which ongoing uh, arrays of experiments are taking place. And um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, thanks for your time. So um, we want to ask uh, that people use the Q&A mic to ask questions since we're recording. Um, but I thought I'd take advantage of making this announcement to ask a question myself, um, which comes, I think, sort of in between um, Dominic and John's presentation. And it's about... Um, exactly what it is that happens at the, um, what Jonathan was calling the screen attention nexus, because it seems like the, I mean, your polemic is so totalizing and very convincingly so. You know, if media is this sort of assault on our senses, which organizes our sense ratios in McLuhan's terms, and all against the background of this sort of stochastic, probabilistic infra temporality, you know, which is producing modes of subjectivation, you know, on the level of affect itself. Um, I mean, the sort of totalizing nature of that critique seems so inescapable. But then I thought that your ending with the, what was it, squatter punk film, was so interesting and almost suggested this sort of, the opening of that to a kind of imminent critique in the form of works of art being able to temporalize differently you know, or create different forms of space, time, um, attention at the site of that nexus. And I was just wondering if that was what you were thinking 
When you um, ended on that very striking note, or what you thought of that, um, sort of what happens at that site? I don't think I can answer that um, adequately, but I mean, you know, we make things, and, and one of the strategies that I've been pursuing is a kind of checkmating of um, the subjective moment. And it, because I, I feel that there's an imminent crisis, and um, there's also a, at the same time, a kind of worldwide foreclosure of democratic potential, which is um, produced through a kind of mediation of that crisis and a development of more and more relations um, which allow a distancing from that at, at both personal and collective levels. Um, so that seems to me to be uh, something that uh, has um, a kind of urgency uh, that requires a response, not just um, you know once in a while, but all the time. And uh, so I feel uh, like I'm drawing on a lot of uh, negative dialectical uh, techniques and critiques of the spectacle and things like that to kind of checkmate um, a set of options um, in order to uh, insist upon a need to open out into a kind of beyond, which it's not really for me to say what that is. Um, however, uh, I'm, I'm reaching for it in my own work, and uh, I hope that I know that many other people on the list are uh, as well. Um, you asked what goes on in the... Uh, screen attention nexus. I think um, many things, maybe almost everything, uh, in, in some way passes through that relation. I mean, even if it's not um, obviously uh, in the first instance, it's in the nth instance. I mean, whether it's decisions about uh, the military industrial complex or po war, global policies on war or um, enclosure. Um, environmental questions. There's some relationship because of the um, distribution of capital through so many networks uh, between each individual moment and the totality of um, of, of capital situations. Um, and I feel that the, one of the reasons why Khan's work is so compelling is that um, he insists upon the simultaneity of the highest uh, possibilities of technology and kind of the realities of the global south and that these things um, need to be thought together all the time. And so I, I guess and that's the kind of urgency that I was trying to produce. Um, I, I, I could say more, but I shouldn't right now. Hi, my name is Henry Warwick. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm mostly focusing on what Do Dominic was talking about, but it also relates to what everybody else was talking about. So I took some notes, and there's three questions involved with this. Uh, the problems uh, specifically of the extraction curve of Hubbard uh, for the oil extraction is one of gross extraction, not net extraction. And net extraction is determined by the efficiency of extraction technology relative to the ge geological resistance, creating a ratio of energy return on energy investment. And due to the exigencies of geology, energy return on energy investment on oil has decreased over time, starting at 100 to 1 in 1920s to approximately 8 to 1 today, with, an, with a crossover of 1 to 1 by 2025, which means that you will leave it in the ground, as it's no longer an energy source, but has become an energy sink. So, so that's, a, that's a posit point, okay? The... Uh, uh, the definition in physics of energy is the ability to do work. So with a collapse in the energy density and transportability through the loss of oil, we face a collapse of productivity. And given the dependence of uh, information and communication technology on petroleum and commodity culture, doesn't this point to the imminent vaporization of labor and the digital economy itself? A and B, the second law of thermodynamics demands waste and loss and work. Energy goes to heat irretrievably. Where does this fit in a libid libidinal economy? Is Playbor and Web 2.0 actually a heat capture process? An intensification of a mature energy system seeking surplus energy work margins? And those are my questions. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> I'm going to buy some time by asking Jonathan a 10 second question, which is if I use this, will I get arrested? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, and thanks for your very intimidating questions, the kind I precisely hoped wouldn't be asked. Um, by, no, just because I, as soon as I stray into something like oil and geophysics, something I know nothing about, 
Um, I knew there'd be people who knew a lot more about me when I'm trying to squeeze a metaphor. But um, thankfully, you brought it full circle. Um, well, you mentioned, I don't know, I didn't know all that about the, the energy curve, but it's it, the interesting dates to me um, are the 20s, um, especially the American oil boom. Uh, the 20s, 1974, which is the oil crisis, and um, 19, well, 2008. So those are these three ways that I'd map my own curve onto, onto yours. Um, for someone like uh, Lyotard, the, the libidinal economy, there is no difference between political economy and libidinal economy. They are the same thing. So there is no contradiction which you can then, you, know, you can't get back to some unalienated uh, version. And so he would read extra oil extraction itself, being a philosopher, a libidinal philosopher, he would see the search for oil as kind of irrational. You can't measure it in mathematical terms. Like, there was so much drilling going on, far more than anything to do with profit, that it was just this kind of explosive, um, collective, <laughs> penetrative frenzy. Um, and if they started to make money, then that's all, all well and good. Um, so I think that's, that's the obverse of Stiegler. And he, he also talks about that it's not uh, Taoist in, in, in the uh, Tao Ching. There's a lot of uh, gender, like not withholding orgasm is a way of harvesting like stealing the woman's yin energy. So there's all these techniques of the, of the, of the male lover to, um, you know, to try and extract the heat of the woman, but not, um, but not without any surplus, without uh, any, um, you know, yeah, without giving, <laughs> right? <laughs> take, take, take. Um, so I don't know, my, my very, um, unqualified answer to you would be, as you notice, I finished with more or less a series of questions than any conclusion, but would be that I see a interesting um, way to go with that, but I'm not sure, I, I'm just, I, I'm, it's too much for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> but I think my, my response would be a fall back on what I do know and which would be to metaphorize it further and, and read those kind of statistics metaphorically, discursively, to see where, it's, where it can't be measured on balance seats or even explained on it. Because a lot of the, as we know, Wall Street and things cannot be, um, they're, they're not rational, they're not scientific like that. Um, the sun gives us, so I'm told, the sun gives us far more energy in a single day than we need, than, than, than we need. I mean, we can use if we cover half of California with the, with the right panels, we would have enough energy. If you kill California. Yeah. Gone. Yes, it was halfway there. Um, so we could use the half one there. Um, so I'd be, yeah, that's a really just sad. I wish I could answer it better. Hi, I'm... Oh, oh yeah, does somebody else. I would just say it really quickly. Um, you know, what, I would, what I would ask back is, uh, I mean, I'm completely amenable to reconceptualizations of categories for biomass and, and, and relations among organisms and the environment and thermodynamics, but I would want to know what kind of work that reconceptualization might do. I mean, would uh, be, what becomes the, uh, the stakes in a, in a kind of renaming uh, and recategorization of social process? I want to thank all of you for a really interesting panel. I'm Gina Neff, and I have a two-part question uh, that's primarily focused on um, issues that Dominic and Mark brought up. So social network analysts make a really clear distinction between the study or articulation or social network analysis and social networks, and, and that is in the explicit articulation of connection. So um, in my own personal life, and for probably most of you, we don't think about our weak ties. We don't think about our friends of friends. Uh, you know, we think about those people we are connected to. And um, it, it seems to me that part of what we're 
dancing around in this conversation of the work of social networks is, is in that articulation of connection. It's not um, so much my going on Facebook and grooming my social networks that's um, causing exploitation or alienation. It's actually what's being done with the articulation of that. And so in that vein, with that setup, um, for Dominic, the question is, um, I'd love to hear you um, explicitly address the difference in libidinal energy of social networks and social networking. I think you 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 kind of got to that in the talk. Maybe I missed it, but just to hear you um, push on that. And and for Mark, it's kind of the same question, but with alienation. And and I also wondered as you were as you were wrapping up your talk, um, this connection between the explicit articulation of connection in our social networks as being valuable is also, I think, a metaphor for, for data. Um, that listening post piece is data unconnected. It's really valuable when it's connected. So if you could address the, the notion of art articulation of connection. Um, thank you. Um, one, one, ghost, one ghost behind what Stiegler is saying that I didn't mention is Marcuse. Uh, you know, in fact, I, he more or less has repackaged Marcuse um, for, for his own, just given them different words. Um, and so there is a bit of a deja vu aspect, and that's where I would see the, in a caricatured form, the, the difference between libidinal investments in a social network as opposed to social networking. And it would be about that Dunbar's number I maybe just threw out, that 150 is is has been posited as the maximum for um, a network where you where you can have genuine whatever how you however you measure that concern for the members, and um, I, at even some point I tried to keep my Facebook at 150, but it just wasn't going to happen. Um, but uh, so I think. If libido is not, it's, it, it's not just drive, it's not just sexual, but it's erotic building. Uh, we can see it in anything from like Amish barn building to, you know, the polymorphous perverse uh, activities, the exact opposite of the, the one I just said about Leotard. So it could be tickling your, your neighbor's elbow with a particularly, you know, interesting feather. Um, it could be just a dinner, it could be, it could be, yeah, making something together. So I think what I want to avoid is um, going completely along with Stiegler, who after all has just bought a, a, an old mill in order to have a very small symposium um, environment. I don't, I'm not against that, I'd love to attend, of course. But how do, we, how do we make that scalable, a genuine libidinal relationship scalable? Because the difference is, of course, that um, how deep, Depth model is another problem. How, how intense can ties be when they are just status updates or they are, they're very quickly um, back and forth in that mode? So I think that the dif that's the difference is the intensity isn't there in Facebook um, or in ne social networking um, for someone like Stiegler, but I would, I would hesitate to throw that baby out with the bathwater. So it's... I guess you can only ask the people who are involved what works and what doesn't, and there's no reason why it shouldn't work on opposite sides of the planet. You shouldn't have to be in the same, you know, um, water mill to, to, to experience it. But that's, that's the rub, yes. Um, it, it's, it's the difficulty of, having, of making, of acknowledging the, the truth of Dunbar's number to an extent, but not then making that a nostalgic, conservative argument for small town community or something like that. Um, I'm, uh, tell me if I'm getting your, the way you're using articulation right. Uh, but I, I think uh, it's a great question. I, I, um, I guess one question that I'd have or, or one kind of claim that I might be interested in making and then maybe withdrawing uh, is what, what happens when the, um, the awareness of our social net, when, when a certain kind of reflexivity enters into the um, uh, entrepreneurial value of the networks? That, so that'd be one question, right? Like, I, I'm not aware of my, of my um, 
friends of friends, uh, not where at that level, until I come to understand um, that there's a certain uh, there's a certain market value to those. Okay, that that might be one way to answer it. I, I think maybe a more interesting way to answer it is is to ask that question, even though we're not aware of these, or as as you describe it, uh, uh, applications like Facebook. Um, generate, at least in certain quarters, <laughs> not those who limit their friends to 150, uh, a kind of fascination with accumulation, right? So, so I, uh, e even though in, on, in, at an everyday level, and I, I've experienced this, I don't know if you've experienced this, sometimes I, I make the mistake of posting stuff to Facebook and then forgetting that they're like 500 people, or I, I can't remember, well, many people that I'm not thinking about, and I would not have th I've taken into consideration at all in, in putting that post out there, but it's now because it's a push medium, they get it. <laughs> Um, so, the, so to me, the, the interesting question I think it, it uh, connects with, with your presentation has to do with what's the, lo what's the logic, it, <laughs> what's the libidinal economy of the accumulation of, of, uh, of friends this way? And that's to me a really interesting question. I wish Jody Dean were here because mm -hmm. th this is something that she's been writing about and thinking about and she couches it in terms of, of a certain uh, logic of drive, um, which uh, she kind of reframes uh, a, Lac a Lacanian argument in ways that allow her to be critical of, of uh, uh, the way in which drive functions in the interest of capital. And, th and th in the way that this kind of um, creation of, of connection for connection's sake, right? The, the content is the connection. The con it's, it's not thinking about the relationship to the friends, but the content is the, is the connection itself. Uh, and, and the way that switch in the object uh, of, you know, not the object of getting uh, of of getting the friend, but but finding in the in the connection itself something in, in that ever accumulating logic, the um, uh, is a ultimately a productive and capturable logic. So, <laughs> okay, hello, I'm Trevor Schultz. Um, so I'm three hours of sleep. I will try to be articulate. <laughs> Um, but I, I just really wanted to, I mean, there's always, you know, I would have loved to insert this in the debate uh, on the list before, and especially addressed to Mark and Jonathan. Um, it's really like, I, I really think that the term exploitation works hardly ever in these contexts, you know. Mm. And I really like, Mark, what you did with this, and I only have seen, I sort of jump around between these panels, uh, I've only seen uh, your presentation, but it's uh, really, uh, uh, I really liked this piece about uh, coercion, you know, because I think that's exactly what is actually happening, you know, and uh, because people, to the very few people uh, who, like one of, like say, like if you have 170 million people who are active on Facebook, 200 million people who are, uh, you know, members there, they, uh, it would be interesting to poll that uh, and have a real study on this, but, uh, you know, just as an impression, I would certainly say that it's that most people don't have an idea of the data mining that is going on, right? So what would so that maybe would be an argument to make, but that's not just, so in that sense, yes, it is maybe exploitation. But I would really much rather use the term, you know, expropriation of value than than exploitation. That I think very few cases where you could really talk of exploitation. And maybe to to Jonathan's uh, uh, approach, you know, I just feel like it's really. Um, uh, I, I mean, for me, all that sticks, I mean, if I think of the, you know, like, f you know, four billion people that use cell phones and actually are exactly in the global south and in developing countries, you know, so that's, uh, you know, definitely extending this whole argument that we are making. And there are tools, of course, like Text Eagle and uh, other ones uh, that, that bring this into play where, where this whole debate really clearly does not uh, extend to the 2% of the world population that have internet access, you know. So it, it vastly reaches into the global south. And it's, it's applicant there as well. Um, so, you know, it's more provocation, you know, not really an argument. Uh, but. So this, and then also what I felt is that it's really, I would, I, I, with Mark, I felt like strongly that the, you know, there are so many uh, upsides to this real like kind of like dark side vision, right, that's presented. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But like I said uh, this morning, I tried to say, it's like that it would be really nice to bring this both into play, right? I mean, Facebook with all its Intutel uh, data mining, you know, it's also, you know, has fabulous, uh, you know, plethora of activist projects that really did stuff, you know, so you can't discount that. And also the friendships are actually, you know, there, there are, of course, studies on that too, where people who have real life relationships, face-to-face uh, -face relationships, and then continue those on Facebook, that they do deepen and strengthen. 
Okay. Probably not very articulate, but, <laughs> but provocative enough, maybe a little bit. <laughs> I feel provoked. <laughs> I, 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 I agree with your points. I, you know, in, in terms of the dark side, I, I, yes, I, I would, I'd want to... Um, I'd want to concede that there are all kinds of wonderful uh, potentialities and possibilities. And I am going to be organizing a march on Washington on my Facebook page for uh, a single payer healthcare. <laughs> I'll let you know how it pans out. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I, I, I take that point seriously. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of expropriation, you know, I agree with the point again. And this to me is a, is a question and a, and a problem for me. Uh, the, the only follow up I'd say is okay, then, then whence? Uh, do we ground, or uh, on what do we ground our critique of expropriation? That's, that's the only question that then occurs to me. Uh, and it seems to me, I, I, I want to, there's a part of me that wants to um, get all the way down there. Well, so that's it. Right? You know, like maybe one, because uh, also Jonathan said in the interview, what comes next, and I think what comes next after the analysis is exactly, for me, the most important point to make it into a positive critique, right? Hmm. Not just say doom and the end. Mm. So uh, transparency would then be some kind of well, overcoming of alienation. Or this, to know yeah. the stories that are told about us and uh, you know, to know if these stories are accurate and uh, who has access to these stories. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, what Mark was, was uh, presenting here uh, actually makes a pretty good argument um, for why we shouldn't replace exploitation by expropriation because I think what you were um, what you were saying was that you know it's not just um, the capture of surplus but um, it is you know, also a question of you know, a subjective relation um, or a relation of subjectivity to um, to capital for for lack of a better word um, in whatever arena we're talking about. So I think you know, the, the term exploitation um, is much wider than that. And I, mean, I think we're losing uh, something um, if we're replacing it by expropriation. I mean, to my mind, expropriation um, you know, speaks solely um, about um, you know, surplus and, and the capture thereof. But I mean, it doesn't talk really about um, it's just a very alienating argument, you know. That's also another issue with that, you know, especially in American context, where where you will not find a single student that would sign on to that. You know, <laughs> they would sign on to expropriation, they would sign on to being used, but they would never allow you to say that they are that they are exploited. So it's also maybe a question of how people actually listen hmm. in an American context. All right. Yeah, a question of branding. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, where did Adam go? Oh, there, there he is. <laughs> one might have said uh, tactics, but I agreed. Um, I just have one quick comment to, to, this, uh, to this Trevor's question. To go back to uh, the um, number of friends that people acquire on Facebook, of course, the, the Marx quotation, um, mm -hmm. a man's wealth is the wealth of his connections, immediately uh, springs to mind. And uh, the trick is to uh, capture that wealth, right, to, to find a way to uh, make it productive and expropriate it. I mean, Yahoo, Google, all these co companies whose names we, we now well know were able to uh, have their IPOs because they were able to speculate on the value of the attention or the ex um, exchange that uh, bodies were willing to, uh, to uh, engage in with uh, social, uh, with, with uh, technologies. Um, and I, I think what's important to remember, and in, in that very uh, sketchy, uh, ske briefly sketched scenario, is that people produce these things uh, for their own purposes, right? I mean, that, that we are all engaged in a war to free ourselves and our communities in one way or another, and that we do look to our weak relations sometimes to strengthen whatever kinds of so forms of social empowerment we have. And we need to find ways to protect and guard those things and also to extend them, right? Because they are constant, I mean, you know, the Marx examples, I, don't, I didn't know all these things, but the, the, the number of ways to expropriate um, uh, our subjective potential and our creative power are obviously involving it with an unbelievable dyn dynamism. The more we know about them, the more we may be able to counter them, although maybe that's ca getting caught in a Foucauldian kind of uh, stasis where one becomes a scribe of, of power. Uh, and I, I feel like uh, our, your point about um, context is extremely important, right? Not everybody needs to know um, the world and the language that we're speaking right here to throw a stone. Yeah, um, 
we might need to know some of this language because we're doing work in particular institutions in solidarity with other kinds of movements. So we'd have to develop our tools very carefully in the context in which we're actually working in. I'm Adam Arvidsson. I just wanted to um, uh, elaborate a little bit on what Trevor said and, and the last sort of discussion uh, on, on how to think about exploitation. And of course, how to think about exploitation, alienation, all these sort of other things sort of in the end boils down to how to think about value and value creation, at least if you want to sort of maintain some sort of Marxian or post-Marxian framework for that, right? And um, there's been, I mean, there's been some echoes here in the presentations by Jonathan and by Mark particularly, as well as in the discussions before on the IDC list about labor theory of value and the utility of the labor theory of value in conceptualizing these things. And um, I'm not going to enter into that debate now because it's sort of highly technical and maybe a little bit boring for people who don't have this particular fetishistic interest. Uh, but um, let me just say that to my mind, I don't think that the labor theory of value is the best way to conceptualize social production, Facebook, social media, and, and the online economy. Uh, might be very functional in conceptualizing other forms of exploitation, such as sweatshop labor and so on and so forth, right? And I, I don't think that clinging on to the labor theory of value for reasons of political correctness, which I sort of understood to be Jonathan Beller's position, uh, is the right way to go because that somehow, you know, that limits the analysis to a large extent. Um, so I think the question that we all need to work on in, to some extent is to sort of how can we, I mean, is it possible for us to conceive of some other type of unitary definition of value creation that can replace labor in order to understand the dynamics that we've been talking about, right? Um, and I just wanted to make a very quick suggestion or at least thought experiment in, in that direction. And I'll talk more about that in the after this afternoon where I'll present my own uh, genius solution to this problem. Uh, but um, if we sort of... If we take this sort of the, the if we take this if we try to historicize this discussion a, a little bit, right? I mean, the labor theory of value was not something that Marx invented by himself, but rather, labor as a source of value begins to enter into discussions of political economy in the in the 18th century, basically, um, and it does that as sort of the reaction of a long-term social process in which labor actually emerges as a social subject. When something like abstract labor becomes possible to conceive of instead of the concrete labors of different types of individuals. Right? Process that has to do with the emergence of a market society and so forth that we can date somehow from the 14th century up until the 17th and so on. Right? Um, by which this category emerges and it becomes possible to sort of compare different types of labor and it becomes possible to sort of assign a scarcity to labor and so on. And labor essentially becomes detached and delinked from its natural environment, right? In a feudal economy, it was not for a feudal lord, labor was not something separate from the land. And, so on. and I would wonder, I mean, couldn't we argue that the great sort of social remediation spurred by social media and, and Facebook and all the other sorts of stuff that are doubtlessly going to become even more efficient in the next decades is doing something very similar with effect. Right? That we used to have something, effect used to be conceived in a sort of a anthropocentric subjectivistic sense as linked to the body and linked to individual experience and so on. Now we're beginning to get something that we could call abstract effect, or I call it general sentiment, drawing on Marx and Tard, uh, that can be sort of elaborated in different ways in the sort of information processing ability that, that Mark talked about, and it can be elaborated in, in the friendings and friends book, and it, it can kind of be. Um, so my suggest, my question would be, I mean, do you think it's conceivable to say that, okay, value in these contexts uh, are not so much related to abstract labor or abstract labor time, but they're more related to abstract effect and the value creation becomes very much a matter of the ability to organize abstract effect into something that's a commodified product such as Facebook. Facebook's a bad example because they're not making a lot of money, but a brand maybe is a better example. Right? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I would agree with most of that, actually, um, surprisingly. But, uh, but no, I, I found that a very interesting account. And in fact, I mean, in the kind of eight or ten years which, um, where I was publishing articles that led, it, led up to the cinematic mode of production, I was making a similar argument, although I, uh, my particular wager was with what I call the attention theory of value, which, was, uh, which I said um, was reduces to um, 
the uh, labor theory of value at uh, sublight speeds because I mean, if you think about the relationship with the machines, there, are, there isn't a kind of attending to machines which is then uh, transformed when the industrial uh, revolution reaches the eye, right? And the whole sort of sensorium is then uh, slated for industrialization um, and a new set of interchanges um, on the assembly line, which was the cinema. Uh, and um, I've, I've been thinking for a long time about politic of, politics of affect and effective labor as um, a form of expropriation uh, and also a, as a form of production. And you know, the, the, the Italians are also very good on this, as is someone named Sarah Ahmed. Uh, and uh, you know, so this is just to kind of agree. But I think what's, what's significant is to see the continuities between these two forms and to see that they... Um, there is a moment of monetization in the continuing accumulation of capitalism, which uh, treats effective capacities in ways similarly to the ways in which labor was treated in a, pr in a prior era and still is. As, uh, as we know, feudalism still exists. As we know, slavery still exists. So all these modes of production uh, coexist simultaneously now, but the paradigm has become effective. So I think this might be fairly simple <laughs> uh, to answer. Uh, but uh, you know, in thinking in terms of say like something like uh, quantum mechanics where uh, you know, if you want to find out where an electron is precisely, you hit it with the ray of light, which of course changes its position. Do you think that all of this technology that's allowing people to see um, very immediately these sort of uh, previously ambiguous social moments or cultural, uh, cultural trends and such, in what way do you think that they might change or alter the course of those trends in a way that's maybe quite fundamental? You know, because traditionally or classically, you know, once a trend is seen, it's over. You know, like if you realize that everybody's doing something, then you kind of stop doing it. So what is the, is there a sense of the larger kind of effect that this sort of um, concrete knowledge of the ambiguous has either in culture or the marketplace that I don't know if anyone wants to. Maybe Mark, I think was where okay. I was. That's what you got mean, me thinking about knowledge it. Knowledge of the processes that are taking place, so knowledge of, of data collection processes? Is that well, what you're No, I'm thinking? saying that does the, act, does the act of data collection change the, data, does it change the data that's being collected, making it on some level fundamentally inaccurate? Does that make any sense? Um, it makes sense. I'm not sure if the standard is, is accuracy. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the logics of all of, of all of these economic mobilizations are, are, um, are pragmatic. <laughs> so, um, so yes, I would say uh, if it, it comes to a model of accuracy, I think that's probably correct. Uh, but if the efficacy of the use of the information, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, it, uh, I, for a pop culture version of this, see Chris Anderson's The End of Theory. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's seen that article. The idea is we don't care what the underlying story is. We don't even care about the accuracy in some sense of, of the data as representative. Um, what we care is about surface patterns of correlation that have a certain type of predictive value. Uh, and, uh, and so for the purposes of, of you know, modulation of affect and so on, um, maybe accuracy isn't is isn't necessary. I guess that's what I said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Goldhaber, and I would like to make a few remarks. Um, first of all, uh, Dominic mentioned. Uh, well, no, let me start with Mark. Uh, <laughs> you started off by rather snidely referring to my comment about being able to cash in on attention. You don't understand, I'm afraid, that you first have to attract the attention. You can't just have an audience and get it in that way. You were listening. And, and <laughs> I was listening to that. Some of what you said was quite boring, as were most of the other speakers, I must say. But you stayed. I did stay because I wanted to make a comment. You wanted to comment. have at me. That's attention. And that is some degree of attention, and you can cash in to that extent. Okay. Uh, but you also probably cash in by getting academic positions and in other ways, as do most of the people on the panel probably. So it's really uh, idle and, and quite snide to make your remark. Um, secondly, Dominic emphasized the libido, at least in the part I heard of his talk. And I just wanted to say that uh, three of you, the first three speakers especially, 
we're sitting in the dark, mostly reading the, especially the first two of you, reading the texts from your PowerPoint presentations, having no contact whatsoever with the audience that I could see and being quite affectless. I thought that really quite amazing, considering the subject of what you were talking about, and uh, demonstrates to me a huge disconnect uh, that uh, deserves some examination, because this is a situation typically uh, in a room like this, it's a classroom, and people are forced to attend for reasons of their own, but not necessarily to pay attention. So uh, it's worth pay, taking in mind that that might be the case. Uh, finally, I would like to mention uh, Mark's discussion of exploitation in general. But first, I, I want to say something about his remark at the beginning, the uh, parable of the road. Uh, if you were to ask people in this country whether they would rather pay for the internet by taxes or whether they would rather pay fees or whether they would rather not pay but have information collected about them and cookies and so on, I'm sure that they would choose the current method. And uh, that may not be true in every country, but it is true in this country. So I think it is a partially conscious choice. But in addition to that, the degree to which people are exploited by having random information about them connected so that ads can be fed at them seems to me to overlook the fact that there's a certain amount of consumer uh, ability to buy things in the economy and it's not going to change as a result of that. So that doesn't really enlarge it, it just may change where it goes. Uh, finally, I would like to point out that one thing Jonathan Beller said that I thought was more or less correct uh, was uh, that there are two or three or four billion people who are in one sense or another immiserated or dispossessed or whatever term one chooses to use. And that seems to me far more important than the niggling degree of exploitation on the internet. So I wonder why you try so hard to find out about that when it's, to my mind, as I will explain in my talk, one of the least significant things about the internet and one of the least significant things about the world. By the way, it's incorrect that only 2% of the people in the world use the internet. It's closer to uh, about over 10%, 11, 12, 13, and probably a lot more indirectly. Well, I, I apologize for the snideness, although I feel it's counteracted by your calling my talk boring. So, I'll, <laughs> No, I'll, your <laughs> talk was the least boring of the okay. floor. Well, thank you. I guess, so, so I guess... Libidinally, then, I don't know what that means. Um, I, I, I take the point about, about exploitation. I think that's, I think that's an important point um, in terms of immiseration versus uh, exploitation of people who go on Facebook. Um, I, the, I, I, I concede that. I think down the road, um, as, the, as the Internet adapts to the commercial model that uh, is created for it, it may be uh, important to think more about the questions that I raised, or at least that's, that's my wager. Um, uh, as for the model of, of the road, um, this is what's interesting to me, if, and, and I, I'm not sure if this is the point you're making. If, if, we, can, if we were to say, actually, these forms of information collecting, uh, collection and attempts at suasion and, and persuasion actually are not uh, a form of power and might, necess might not necessarily work, then, then of course the commercial model of the internet is, as currently understood is speculative and bound to fail. Um, and in that case we might actually see a, a, a kind of reconfiguration of, of how it's organized. I don't know what the answer to that is, but it seems to me that there, there's a certain internal logic there that we have yet to see play out. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're right.